When it comes to continuous glucose monitors, we've seen implantables, all-in-one pumps and CGMs, and the traditional ones, inserted with an applicator. But today, we're talking about a new CGM that promises to deliver glucose readings non-invasively. No Labs recently announced the NoU, its non-invasive CGM. The company has shared an early study with research showing relatively impressive accuracy. I asked about the study and when we can expect to see it on the market. Welcome to the show. I'm Justin. I have type 1 diabetes and on here I talk all things diabetes tech, news and management with tech leaders, educators and those thriving with diabetes. No Labs is the leading worldwide IP holder in non-invasive blood glucose monitoring with more than 270 patents issued, pending and in process. Its no-U wearable uses a radio frequency dielectric sensor to continually measure glucose. I got to speak with No Labs Chief of Product Officer Steve Kent about how this technology works. We talk about the plans for it to get smaller, when people will start wearing it, and he shows us the latest generation and an older model. So watch this video on YouTube later for some visuals. There's a link in today's show notes. Steve has a pretty cool background. Prior to No Labs, he worked at Aura. It's the well-known health tracking wearable ring. One of his roles there was leading global scale data collections and research partnerships to enable advanced health sensing algorithm development. That spanned sleep, illness, women's health, activity, and more. So we geek out on that a bit. Keep in mind that anything you hear on this podcast or any content on all of my pages is not medical advice. Always consult with your physician before making changes to your health care. Today's episode is sponsored by T1D Exchange. You can directly make an impact on diabetes healthcare, treatments, and technology by participating in the T1D Exchange registry. It starts with a simple survey about your life with T1D, and it only takes about 15 minutes. After that, you'll have a personal portal with ongoing T1D study and survey opportunities. Plus, some of these studies even offer compensation. Signing up with the link in the show notes helps support my channel and it allows me to continue putting out free content. You can sign up at t1dexchange.org slash diabetic or click that link in today's show notes. Steve, welcome to the podcast. I am so excited for what we have to talk about today. Uh, you're actually a star. You were in the No Labs video that I saw that inspired this this episode in this interview, I, I saw a video of your know you device. I'm happy to ask you some questions about it. So thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to, to chat with you. Of course. Can you kind of tell me first, like how long has no labs been around? Is no labs known for this device and technology or has it been working on other stuff in the past? No labs was actually founded in 1998. Uh, and we got our roots started in optical-based sensing systems. So how do you use light um, and, and optical systems to measure things? Uh, and there was this huge surge in interest in, well, how do you measure things in the human body to improve human health with non-invasive modalities? So optics was a perfect target to do explorations and see how that can you know, turn into systems to help people. Um, and over time, the company and, and our development team made a lot of headway into how do you use optics for things like, uh, um, you know, quality assessment and measurement and uh, from a foundational perspective, but also specifically looking at glucose. Uh, and as you know, and I think all the listeners know glucose, having a good solution that's not invasive for that has been tried by many different companies over the years because it's such a great need. Um, and it's something that we really want to solve. So uh, the interesting thing is along the way, our R&D team found you know, there is one configuration of LEDs that if you turn the power all the way off uh, up, you sort of take them apart a little bit and under perfect conditions, uh, you can actually see what looks like glucose. Um, but in those types of experiments, you're learning a lot. And they reflected and realized that, you know, this is, this is technologically interesting, but from a commercial perspective, can, can you actually make it into a commercial product? That approach wasn't viable. So, uh, and, and I think you will see if you look at other companies in the past, a lot of people who sort of towed the line on optics and LEDs for, for glucose um, were not able to achieve the level of success that's needed to work as a medical device. 
Uh, and, and that's where our R&D our R&D team is quite different. They actually looked at the problem and took a step back and said, okay, this is not going to be commercially viable. Let's look at different ways to move energy through the human body. Uh, and they looked down the electromagnetic spectrum away from visible light uh, and said, all right, let's look in microwaves and radio waves. Uh, and they spent years developing and, and rapid prototyping different types of electrode arrays and antennas and RF architectures, which is how you create the energy. Um, and they very successfully developed the sensor that we have today. Um, and that came to light, you know, I think it was about four years ago. And then we went through very intense bench testing to prove that that architecture is stable. Uh, and then over these last years, we've proved time and time again that the hardware architecture is stable, repeatable, reliable. And now we're on a very well-known development path of miniaturization. Uh, and that's coupled with data collection to inform algorithm development in, in, in that use case. So the company has been around for a long time, but it, it was a series of very big learnings that allowed us to make this technological breakthrough with what we have today, which is our dielectric sensor. So. Very interesting. Before we get into the, the device, I want to hear more about you. How did you get to this point in your career? You know, a big reason that I'm in medical devices is because, uh, you know, my father worked in the industry for a long time. And he instilled in, in my brother and I a great sense of, you know, how do you find purpose and fulfillment in your work? Um, and over his career, he had done some work in military aerospace, also in supercomputer architecture. Um, and he learned, you know, the hard way that it, it's hard to find your sense of purpose and fulfillment if you're not building technology that's, you know, really for good some, most of the time. So when he got into medical device, it was this burst of inspiration. Every day was magic. Uh, and growing up, he would bring all of that technology home and, and I would sit with him and for fun we would take these devices apart, we would innovate together, and, and that's really how we spent time together, was in our garage, which was effectively a small R&D lab. <laughs> um, so that, that sparked my creativity, and I, I think really my natural curiosity in this class of technologies. Um, and then that has, over time, blossomed into a very deep passion for seeing that, you know, in my opinion, I think the greatest value that technology can provide is helping people live the healthiest and you know, most enriched lives possible. So I got my feet started in medical device design and manufacturing engineering uh, over a decade ago, building electrosurgical tools and systems. Um, that is a very cool place to work. It's really high tech. It's literally cutting edge. You know, you're doing these advanced procedures. Um, but I was working for larger companies at that time uh, as a consultant and doing, you know, the cutting edge R&D work that would then get trickled into these major production systems. And I had this a little bit sense of frustration because larger corporate entities are designed to, you know, really generate an, a, a successful economic return on their existing programs. Uh, and as an innovator, your job is to go and disrupt all of that. So, I, you know, we were sort of caught in these, you know, um, uh, uh, not battles, but discussions constantly of, you know, I was always wanting to push to do something bigger and faster to help people. And then the economics of a larger business would always push back and say, hey, we need to spend 10 or 20 years and make all of our money on this product line before we do something new. So that led me to found my own company, which was a neurostimulation company called Invicta Medical, which still runs today. Um, and that was the technology there was designed to treat sleep apnea and snoring, which is another huge unmet need. Uh, I did that for seven years. And then I joined Aura, which is the health and wearable company, which is you know, a really cool consumer system, but they're finding that, that the continuous aura wear. That's the Aura Ring. Yeah. Yeah. So I worked there for three years leading uh, global health partnerships and corporate strategy um, from when they were a very small team of about 30 um, all the way until, you know, three or 400 employees. And it was so cool to take consumer technology and put it into more medical and healthcare settings. Um, and then that led me all the way back to medical devices at no labs today and i'm actually coming up on my two-year anniversary in a few days so amazing congratulations uh i kind of relate to some of what you said where you know i feel like i've finally found this passion that has also become my career and it's so rewarding and it feels less like work because i'm just able to create content that's helping people it makes me feel so fulfilled so uh, it's cool to hear your your origin story, and I, I'm going to want to talk to you about some Aura Ring 
after this interview uh, for sure. But uh, I know everyone listening wants to know more about the device that No Labs announced, which was the No U, which is this continuous glucose monitor that is non-invasive. Uh, I saw the the footage, uh, and if people listening haven't seen it yet, there's a video um, online that you can see what it looks like. Uh, can you kind of just explain to everyone what is this device? What is the No U? Yeah, so the No U is the wearable embodiment of the sensor that we have been developing over these past many years. And through our miniaturization process, we've been making it smaller and smaller so that it can be in a form factor that can be worn 24 hours a day, which is essential as a CGM. And if you're going to provide, obviously, continuous data to individuals who want to understand their, their blood glucose. Um, so it's, this, it's the same sensor that you've seen across all of our announcements, but the technological breakthroughs that have allowed us to make it this size, and we actually see a path for that to continue in miniaturization is incredibly exciting because that makes it easy to use and much more accessible because it needs to be lightweight, it needs to fit into your daily life, um, and it also needs to be very accurate and effective. Um, and I'm happy to go into the details of how the system works. Uh, and, and you know, I think for us, the big things, of course, being entirely non-invasive is the ultimate shift in how individuals will look at monitoring their blood glucose throughout the day. Tell us a little bit about just what this device looks like. How big is it currently? So I actually have one of our, our earlier devices. This is, uh, this is one of the mock-ups. We have all of our units in, in production in R&D right now. So this is the size of a Gen 2. Um, it's a little bit bigger than an Apple AirPods Pro case. Uh, and it is designed to clip in to either an adhesive patch or into a strap that can be on your arm or your wrist or another location on your body. Uh, it has about a 24 hour battery life. It has several accelerometers in it that measure motion. It also has temperature sensors to understand external and body temperature. And then most important, this houses our radio frequency dielectric sensor. Uh, and what that does is when the sensor is against your body, it sends out uh, a wide band sweep of radio frequencies it measures the voltage response at the other end of the antenna. And from that, we can measure analytes or molecules inside the human body with a high degree of accuracy. Interesting. Uh, I want to know more about what's happening there. And maybe you said it and it went over my head a little bit, but what, how, what exactly is the device testing so right like with continuous glucose monitors traditionally used today there's a little sensor in that's testing interstitial fluid is this yep. device piercing the skin with frequencies waves um <laughs> i'm probably butchering <laughs> that and, and testing the interstitial fluid or is it testing the blood what what is it where is it getting that that information from and and how <laughs> you kind of said it but yeah yeah, so that's that's been our, our major technology breakthrough is um, you can think of it as an example. Um, I'll, I'll compare it to LEDs, for example. We're very familiar with what LEDs do and how they can be used for measuring human health. So um, an LED works by transmitting energy and then receiving energy and then measuring what happens in between those two points. Uh, and that's great. The challenges with LEDs, though, is that they have a limited band of frequencies that they operate in. If you want to change that, you have to physically change out the LED hardwares or in include a huge number of LEDs in a, in a small package, which is, is challenging. Uh, and the other issue is because of where the energy that light is on the electromagnetic spectrum, um, light doesn't travel very far through objects. So, for example, if I hold my hand up, you know, I can't see directly through my hand. So, so that's a challenge that LEDs have, is the flexibility and frequencies that they can send out and receive, and the depth that that signal goes into the human body. Other than that, they're amazing, but that limits their capabilities. What we do is actually quite similar in some ways. We transmit energy, and we receive it on the other end, and then we measure what happens in between, but we use radio frequency. And because we use and microwaves, and because we use those two bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can programmatically, so with the same hardware, we can send up to 400,000 frequencies from the transmit into the receive. And because we're using radio frequency in, in that range, we can see through 
you know, things like concrete and metal safely. So with, without damaging the material under test. So we do not have the same issue of how deep can you go into the human body. And we know with our sensor today, we see about 10 millimeters into the tissue. So the sensor is actually creating an energy field above it as we scan through these frequencies. It is looking 10 millimeters into the tissue. And the really amazing thing about what happens when you do that is it creates an electric field. And the molecules, so the gluco glucose molecule, for example, has a very different frequency response. It's called its dielectric permittivity, its ability to store energy. Poles, it, or it attaches to, is another way of explaining it, it attaches to the energy we put in. And at the end, we measure how many, how much of that energy has been pulled out of the system as a voltage response. So in, in principle, it's quite simple. We send out this wideband, it goes deep into the tissue safely. We then measure the voltage response of all of these different molecules pulling energy out of the system. In layman's terms, if more energy is pulled or, or, um, or sucks more energy in, right, there's more glucose. Is that? Yeah, that, that is a fair <laughs> way to, to think about it, yes. <laughs> okay, and kind of what I was going with before, asking about whether it's interstitial fluid or, or not, is the information that this device is receiving or will one day be receiving uh, when users wear it, is it going to have a similar lag in information? And what I mean by that is current CGMs do have a 10 to 15 minute lag because they're testing interstitial fluid. Is this yeah. device testing that same fluid and going to have the same lag? Or is it testing something else and it could be a little more accurate in the moment? Actually, we're, we're measuring all of it. We're measuring skin, capillary, um, blood, interstitial fluid, fat. We're measuring um, you know, deeper layers of blood in the body. And uh, the sensor is measuring anything above it. So that gives us a, a broader picture of how much glucose is in the body across these various stages. Uh, and actually, if you look at our paper that was recently announced at ATTD, we did a direct comparison of our sensor against a venous blood in individuals with type 2 diabetes and prediabetes. And we are able to, in a matter of seconds, conduct a sweep and estimate um, that uh, venous blood value within roughly an 11% MARD in that, in that test condition. So to me, that as a product developer, um, you know, I understand that there's a lot more work to do as we move towards commercialization, but the foundations of technical feasibility and the engineering principles behind it lead me to believe that we're going to be more on the real-time measurement level. Yeah, I, I have some questions about that study. I'm going to save that for a little later. But when it comes to the form factor, you were saying yourself um, that the goal is to get it smaller and smaller. And, you know, it's a slightly larger than AirPods. It's incredible how small you've gotten this device uh, too. But it's obvious that many people are, you know, using smaller devices now. What size do you think that this device needs to be for it to become a viable device to be used? It, it's an interesting question because even in the form factor today, I would actually consider that a viable form factor. I think there's a lot of room for improvement in many different types of technology. And as, as you know, we said, it's going to keep getting smaller over time. But actually, the most important pillars for us as a, biz as a business are um, providing an entirely non-invasive, FDA-cleared blood glucose monitor, providing the most effective and accurate system that we possibly can, uh, and providing that in a very accessible way. One, because it's not invasive. Two, because it's more affordable. And that is a huge distinction between our type of technology and other devices, which they are on the market, like all CGMs. Um, they are a bit smaller than our current version of the device, but they have to be replaced every, you know, let's just call it an average of 10 days. And they penetrate the skin. We don't do either of those things. Once you have a device, you can keep that with you for many years. So the cost burden and the non-invasive nature um, of our system, I think will appeal to a wide variety of, of patients and customers over the coming years as we go down the miniaturization pathway. You kind of said before certain areas where this device could be worn. Can you just repeat those? And also you said, and other places, are there limitless amounts of places that this can be worn? I know with FDA, you need to like enter in 
it's going to be worn here and it's not always approved in all the areas that people wind up using it. But what are your goals kind of with placement with it? One of our big goals for the this year is to actually test all the viable locations on the human body where we can put the Gen 2. Uh, and that's that's one of the great things the Gen 2 enables, being wearable, having these multiple wearable modes. Uh, in our clinical data collections, we can now, for the first time, outfit part- study participants with a variety of sensors. Uh, and then we can use that information to build our data set that will inform algorithm development. And part of that includes things like where is it most comfortable? Where is it the easiest to put on? Uh, and, and other things like do different parts of the anatomy provide a different signature? There's another piece that I'll mention, which is, you know, this is something that we, um, you know, glucose is our core focus, and that's what we're spending all of our energy on. Also, our sensor is relatively form factor agnostic, and it's designed at its core to be a bit of a platform technology because it's analyte agnostic as well. So it can measure many different things. So we try to keep an open mind where, as scientists and our and engineers, what is the what are all the possibilities of what this incredible new technology? It's a completely new sensor. What what can that do? And then for the specific use case for glucose, how do we make that the most accurate and the most comfortable experience possible? In its current form factor, who would this be used for? I guess like age wise, is there an age range that you're looking at? So right now our development path is is clearly focused on individuals and, and this is more adults with type one and type two and prediabetes. Um, as a product leader and a, just as a technology designer and developer, the principles that I operate to are grounded in how do we build technology that can u- be used by anyone. Uh, and that's actually grounded in my philosophy that I think glucose is really just another vital sign that anyone who wants to measure it should be able to. So that's that's the design philosophy is building in that direction. But there are, because this is a medical device, there are known steps that will allow us to um, enter the market in a reliable and very you know safe and, and controlled way. I think one of the biggest gripes with CGM technology these days is how wasteful it feels, and how not even it, not even wasteful, like how invent environmentally terrible it is. Because not only am I always using all these resources, but then I'm taking this big plastic piece and throwing it out every ten days. What are some of the benefits with this device when it comes to, I guess, the environment? <laughs> yeah. So the by being a non-invasive device, uh, we've eliminated the costly disposables associated with CGMs. So um, once you have once you have a, a, a no U device, that will last you for as long as the battery will last. Uh, in the mode where we're using an adhesive, that is something that will need to be replaced. Uh, but it's a different level of replacement cadence because you know we're that's really just a holder against the skin. It has different requirements than hey, we're keeping um, a microfilament in your arm. So you know, for us, that feels really good as developers to be building a system that moves away from the uh, very costly disposables and is providing a much more um, you know a, a, a almost eternally reusable device because it's non invasive. So that's a really excellent piece in our design philosophy as well as eliminating those costs and, you know, trying to be as sustainable as possible. With this device, do you see it eventually being used for automated insulin delivery? It's a really interesting topic. I think if I were to just say like a base sensor development as an engineer, I would say that that's absolutely on a roadmap of how technologies like this will develop over time. It's hard to say exactly when something like that would happen, but, you know, through the data collection and development process, our algorithm validation process, each one of those benchmark studies and, you know, engineering studies will move us further along the development path. And I think that's a normal evolution that you will see in companies that are measuring glucose. Um, and, And I wouldn't put us in a different class for some reason, because our papers suggest that our accuracy can can get there over time. Yeah, and I'm increasingly hearing that a MARD, and for anyone listening, a MARD is the mean absolute relative difference. It's the accuracy of these devices. Um, I've I've been hearing that anywhere around 10 and lower is enough to do automated insulin. That's what I've been hearing. I'm not sure if I'm completely accurate saying that. (laughs) But with you being at 11%, at 11.1% with your at least tests so far, 
you know, I would love to see this technology allowing for that one day. I kind of want to understand what led No Labs to the No You device that we currently have today. You mentioned that it's the same technology, maybe the same chip that's kind of gone from generation to generation. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that this one that we're seeing is the Gen 2. There was like a Gen 0 and a Gen 1. Can you kind of walk yeah. us through these generations and the how we kind of got from one to the to the next? Yeah, so this is also a fun moment of reflection as I come up on my two-year anniversary at, <laughs> at No Labs in a few days. So um, when I first joined the company, it, it's in a very normal phase of R&D. And, and this is, I, I think for our your listeners, this is really cool because this is how all companies develop. You, you know, you build a system in the lab, you start with, you know, breadboards, which are circuits you build by hand and you rapid prototype. And then you move towards custom electronics and printed circuit boards and more advanced ways of connecting the system. So your electrical interconnects. Um, so I joined at that phase where, okay, we've got an antenna that the design works. It's repeatable. It's reliable. We've got the cabling that connects to the RF system uh, and, and that architecture. So that, that printed circuit board architecture and the RF system is also performing it's repeatable and reliable so years of work <laughs> which i'm so grateful for the team for making those huge breakthroughs were, were already in place when i joined uh, and that needs to be put on a bench uh, in our cases we also had it in a chair so people could sit comfortably and do their non-invasive data collections uh, and it also needed to be hooked up to a laptop and you know an external power source so that's a very normal place for a company like this to be in and once those things, you go through your engineering checklist, and once those things are proven, reliable, and stable, it's getting good data, it's like, great, let's make the investment in taking this from a in-lab benchtop form factor into a portable research form factor. Uh, and that's when we developed the Generation 1 unit. And this thing is amazing. It's a portable research lab in your pocket. So the, the larger system I just described, we miniaturized into this which has a long battery life, onboard machine learning capabilities. And what this and, allowed us to do is- for everyone listening, yeah. let's describe the size. So maybe even show it side by side. It, it, what is it, like double, triple the size of the current one? Yeah, much yeah, larger, so maybe the, four the, or five the, times. The, the Gen 2, I'm very proud, is 86% smaller okay. in volume. Yeah, and substantially lighter. So- but this is a normal phase in development. So the Gen 1 was, hey, we need to take our knowledge from the lab out into the real world. We need to test it in consistently built units that are all the same. We need to put those into different environments and locations and see how does our sensor perform in the real world. Uh, and then also, how does the sensor perform when it's built as an integrated and standalone unit? Because it's very different when you compare that to a piece of benchtop technology. So... This was very successful, and the learnings from this allowed us to confidently design Generation 2, which, as we just said, is significantly smaller and lighter. And instead of being still a sort of on the bench top or a table somewhere form factor, it's now wearable. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to collect data, which is, you know, the foundation for all algorithm development is data collection. It allows us to collect data in multiple locations on the body, 24 hours a day, uh, and these are highly reproducible, so we can make a lot of them and also test out the human factors that we were just talking about. So this is, this is very much in the direction of what I would consider a commercial-ready product. This is, the na this is that next evolution in miniaturization and development and portability. I will note that one other big difference is the Know You is connected with a companion app on iOS. So now I don't have to carry a laptop with me when I want to do a data collection. I don't have to carry expensive equipment. I just need my know you and my phone and uh, whatever reference labels we're using in that specific data collection. So it allows us to scale data collection, which is essential for our development. You know, seeing that larger model, uh, again, I saw it at ATTD as well as the know you and seeing the smaller one, they both also give me this, this idea of do you one day hope that not only is this a wearable, something someone puts on, can live their life with, but what about like 
an at-home thermometer of glucose or like a, you know, a blood glucose meter. It's just something you use real quick to, to, to check your blood sugar. Maybe the hospital has it. They put it on your forehead, your wrists, you know, and they take your blood sugar. They're like, all right, you have diabetes or like, you're, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like there's so much potential in that. Is that something you're also trying to succeed with? Absolutely. Or- and, and the way that our team designs our data collections to inform algorithm development is they serve multiple goals. So we are building in the you know, primary direction of the continuous wearable, but that's a very rich data set, which we can start looking for other opportunities, as you mentioned. You know, does this have a role in the hospital? Does this have a role in the home? And I think there are a variety of use cases. Um, and that's all in the spirit, once again, of, our, of the philosophy that I mentioned, which is designing a, a system in the direction that can do two things. One, it can be used by anyone accurately and safely. And two, uh, making sure that we're moving in a direction where glucose is just another vital sign that you can measure. Anyone wants to measure it, you can measure it. That's the goal. And you know, a non-invasive technology like this is that breakthrough that's required for that to become a, a new standard. Yeah, I feel like there's so much potential or so much research left to be done to see how glucose levels impact anyone, not just someone with diabetes. But I mean, there's pe- you know people out there who don't have diabetes have experienced what a low blood sugar feels like or what a, a sugar high feels like. And understanding the connection between these two, um, you know, that there's there's a lot there. Um, and also on a business perspective, there's a lot more money there because <laughs> there's a lot more people without diabetes. It's definitely our, our, our goal to solve the urgent problems first. So I just want to I want to reiterate type one individuals with type one and type two and, you know, eventually individuals with prediabetes is the core focus because this is a this is a crisis. We have to solve this problem. And knowledge is power. It's, if we can help people with more accessible and affordable, accurate measurement, we're going to be a great contributor to solving that problem. And then in the long term, making it a ubiquitous measurement tool. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very excited about the potential in the far future for that. Yeah. And I find there to be something so interesting about the fact that this is a somewhat considerably more sanitary way of checking a blood glucose. So if, if you're at your local pharmacy and you know, maybe there's a station set up. Maybe I should start working for you, but there's a station set up. Someone just puts their wrist on it and then they find out they're pre-diabetic just by going to paying the quarter. You know, they used to have those scales. That you use a quarter and weigh yourself in the pharmacy. Oh, yeah. You just have a blood glucose one. I mean, th- there is the potential because this is so non-invasive, sanitary, that people could one day catch diabetes way sooner just by doing something so simple and you know people without needle phobia whatever have no issue doing it so um this is all kind of coming to me right now and and exciting me (laughs) yeah i mean i i love your way of thinking and and those are the types of things that a non-invasive sensor can provide and it's just breaking down the barriers access easy to use affordable it's reliable you only need one um you know it's all these foundational principles that i think so many people living with metabolic health um, challenges are are just hoping for. And and that's why we're excited to deliver that. Yeah. You you mentioned before that many people have tried to do this. Uh, It's been rumored that Apple's been working on this for some time, but, but no one really has put out much um, information out there. This was really the first time that I was hearing it. I am pretty new to the Uh, to the whole thing. And so I want to get into the study that you brought up before. You were able to achieve 11.1% MARD in this study. To put that into perspective for people, the MARD is, the lower it is, the more accurate it is. So to put it in perspective, Dexcom is 8%. Medtronic's new Simplera is around 10.1%. Abbott's is uh, just below 8%. So I mean, 11.1% is not that far off. Can you kind of just tell us a little bit more about the study that found these um, this, these findings uh, and what that entailed? The big parts of, of that study is um, we worked with individuals who have um, uh, who are living with type two diabetes and pre diabetes, uh, and they come into our lab and they do a standard oral glucose tolerance test. So they come in, they sit in our lab, and we outfit them with a no lab sensor. Um, We also have several reference sensors on them. And most important in this study, 
we are doing, um, you know, with, with, with uh, a nurse, um, we're doing uh, blood draws every five minutes. So we're taking venous blood draws and we are using hospital grade meters to give us a gold standard reference of what that individual's blood glucose is over time. And then the sensor will be scan. Our sensor will be scanning our frequency bands rapidly. Um, and over the course of about three or five hours, as they're going through this test, at a certain point, they'll drink oral glucose and you'll see their blood sugar go up. And then you'll see as their body metabolizes it, you'll see it go down. And the entire time we're scanning our sensor and we're looking at the tissue stack that we scan in comparison to these venous blood reference labels. And then from that, we are able to take a portion of the data and build a model. And then we have a, another portion of the data that's completely held out. And you know, another one of our core operating principles as a business is scientific validation. For us, it is paramount that everything we do is scientifically validated at the highest standards. Um, and if you go on our website, you'll see in our research and validation page, numerous articles and publications deeply describing our methods and mechanisms, all of the results, the way that we do the tests, because we think transparency is essential. Um, so we, we train a model and then we have the held out test data that the model has never seen. And then at the end, um, we use the, uh, the model to look at the held out test data to see, okay, how do, we, how do we perform under a blind circumstance? And that's where we're able to generate that um, you know, 11 point, I think, I believe it's 3%, about 11% MARD in comparison to the venous blood references. And this is a technical feasibility study. So what we've done is we've essentially proven that under these conditions, our sensor is able to non-invasively detect blood glucose. And that gives us the confidence to invest in scaled data collections to test the sensor 24 hours a day in real world conditions. And we need to go and build those data sets. So you're gonna see our data sets climbing in a variety of settings, number of participants, um, and you know, continuing with those best in class medical references as a comparator. How many people were involved in this study and did they have type one, type two? The individuals in the study, the study was up to um, 30 participants and each participant did multiple sessions each. Um, all of the participants span either um, individuals with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. Uh, and, you know, in the future, we're working on studies that will include um, the others that you could imagine. So individuals with type 1 uh, and then expanding our, our uh, log of data collection in type 2 and pre-diabetes as well. What is kind of the plan for your... I know that the next step would kind of be FDA entry. It sounds like there is some time before that what's kind of the the timeline to to getting to sending something to the fda for some sort of clearance so i i can't give you a specific date uh, but i can tell you the steps to get there so um you know o over the last decade we've done this a lot of times and there's a, there's a very straightforward path actually once you have stable hardware stable architecture you've got your form factor uh you do a couple of things the first thing you do is you build a bunch of those that hardware, and then you put that into expanded data collections. Um, so you need to put the sensor into all of the conditions that it could be used in the real world. We'll also expand in lab data collection. And in each of those, we will include the best in class medical references um, to inform our algorithm development. So it's these three blocks, it's hardware stability, build more of them, go and expand your data collections. Uh, and it's getting more participants over multiple days. And then that data is used to inform algorithm data, our data science team, their algorithm development and model development. And then that is the leading indicator for when are we ready to go and submit for our registration studies. Um, and, you know, it, it's not just one large study. It's a sequence of smaller studies that build on those themes. Uh, and it ends up being quite a large data set as we as we approach clearance. So the steps won't change. It's really just a matter of time on task at this point of going and getting out, the, getting the data that we need to then get ready to submit for our registration studies. Great. Well, if you need someone to be part of any of your studies, I'm happy to try it on and come over. <laughs> Let yeah, me know. let's definitely chat about it. Yeah. And then you mentioned that 
the No U has motion and accelerometer sensors in it. What exactly are those for? Do you have plans to one day monitor other things alongside glucose or are, are you already doing that? What are those, what are those doing? It, it's exciting because we are a technology company building this non-invasive glucose monitor. We are also the worldwide IP holder in our technology. So we, we figured out how to make it. We figured out that it works. We figured out that it can, you know, looks like it can do glucose really well and that it can also potentially do many other analytes. So we have built this very robust global IP portfolio and we're the world, worldwide leader in intellectual property for non-invasive dielectric spectroscopy, including for glucose and other analytes. So uh, we're always looking for innovative ways to include inexpensive sensors into that package that will allow us to potentially enhance the customer experience for glucose. Uh, and you know, who knows, it could open the door to other applications that, that we can't expect yet. But um, you know, the, the sensors that we're including are pretty common in what you'll see with commercial wearables today, but accelerometers are really helpful. Temperature sensors are really helpful. Um, and those coupled with our data allows us to have a multimodal sensing kit, which I think we'll, we'll find new things. So that's, that's just the way we like to build products is make them really cutting edge and as, you know, as powerful as they can be so that when we do put them out there, we can constantly be learning and enhancing the device. Yeah, and I've heard it before, and I even have just thought about it myself, is that there is, I believe, a lot of potential tying in other metrics with glucose, especially heart rate and activity. And, you know, you're coming from Aura, so I'm sure you already understand so much the um, the pros of having access to all of these, you know, statistics and um and how they can be used to kind of learn and, and understand connections between things. So um, I'd love to see, I, I look forward to seeing kind of where technology like this goes and how it ties in with um, just other sensors we have out there. I've heard a lot lately uh, from, I believe Abbott mentioned it, Cybionics may have mentioned it as well that, uh, well, Cybionics has a ketone monitor. Abbott is working with a ketone monitor. Uh, these companies are working to bring other metrics is no labs looking at bringing in um, the ability to measure things like ketones or lactose? Uh, so for, for us, we'll just, we'll all call them analytes. So we, we've okay. identified over a hundred analytes of clinical significance. You know, there is a long list of analytes that are on the checklist. I would say all the ones that you could imagine and see in the market today are, are, are things that we are, have considered. Um, glucose is absolutely our priority because of this urgent need for individuals living with type one, type two and, and prediabetes. And that's a problem that, you know, it really needs to be solved. And, and we, we feel uh, like really strongly that we, there just has to be a technology breakthrough to help the world manage, manage this better. So that's where our heart is. Um, but as the worldwide IP holder in dielectric spectroscopy, it, the field is broad for what other types of analytes are up for exploration and experimentation. So I can't comment exactly on some of our R&D work, but there are others on the list that are of great interest. And the cool thing for me is now that we have the Know You, it is the same process for a new analyte, just like there's hardware, data collection, model developments, glucose. That's the current goal. If you want to look at something it's a different analyte that's also really important. It's the same hardware. It's a new data collection, model development, next analyte. So the process is very robust and, and reliable. And I think as the company evolves and I, you know, really trying to understand how we want to prioritize these, um, these goals, it will be more of a matter of time. And, and I look at it very fondly, like you know, when LEDs were invented many years ago, you know, today we have the knowledge of how LEDs are used all around the world in all of these exciting applications. But the foundational technology when they first started was transmit, receive, can we make a light with a diode? Uh, and then it, you know, evolved into all of, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of different applications in health and, you know, many other things that you see in your day to day. We have the luxury of hindsight of what you can do when you invent a new ground, uh, a, a new foundational sensor we know and can predict all the ways that that can be used in the future. And for us, it's extremely exciting because 
it's quite rare to develop an entirely new sensor like this that can set a new class of sensing. Yeah, I'm excited to see uh, where the technology goes, uh, where it ends up. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show. I have to say it was it was fun just talking to you and watching you and you just are so enthusiastic and I can tell you're so into this uh, as am I. So it was fun to just hang out and, and uh, I'd love to also just geek out <laughs> on technology yeah. you, on technology with you again. So I, I hope to have you on the show again. Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. And uh, yeah, I, I love this stuff. So it's it's such a great pleasure to you know chat with another person who's really excited about it because um, we're trying to do important things. And uh, all of the insight from individuals like you who have a firsthand understanding of, hey, how is this technology going to improve my life? What do I need companies to think about that will help me live the healthiest and most free life possible? Um, those are the things that we also want to hear from from you and other you know, future customers and, and, and it, um, contributors along the way. So our, our doors op always open to feedback and great insights. So it's, it's also very enriching for me. So thank you for that. What do you think of Know You and the prospects of a non-invasive glucose monitor? Let us know in the comments on YouTube. And if you've got feedback for the show or want to join our newsletter, click the link in the show notes. For exclusive videos, input on future content, and direct messaging with me, check out my Patreon. You can get all of that for the price of a latte, a link in the show notes as well. If you want to support the show for free, consider giving it a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Episodes of this podcast release every Monday, wherever you listen and on YouTube. There is a link to my YouTube channel and social account in the show notes. I'm Justin, and I'll see you next week.